All right, so our last presenter for the day before our panelist discussion will be Rachel Rogers. She's the zoological consultant for AZA Professional Fellows, um, retired. She's also retired from the Zoological Registry Association. And today she'll be talking about a zoo registrar's perspective on welfare and transportation. Please put it together for her. Hi, everybody. Let me just advance. Okay. All right. My name is Rochelle Rogers. Um, I've worked in the zoo industry over 50 years. I've also worked in lab animal science. I was a certified lab animal technician. Um, I've worked in private sector institutions. Um, and I started as a young kid. My dad was an animal trainer and uh, he started working in zoos in uh, the mid 60s. So um, I'm gonna talk to you from a varying perspectives. I started out in animal care and then my last 20 years, I was a zoological registrar for Zoo Miami. So I'll, I'll slowly go from the nice working with animals to working in paperwork and uh, that type of thing. Okay, not. Uh, I don't see the thing. Okay, Whew. that was so hard. Okay, so um, when you're uh, in a zoo and you're uh, shipping animals, there's different things that you have to look at bes uh, besides making sure that you're looking after the welfare of the animal. Um, we also are very regulated. There's a lot of industries that are regulated. We work really closely with Fish and Wildlife, USDA, uh, Customs and Border Protection if we're doing an international transport, um, Homeland Security. Uh, sometimes uh, we have to work with them really closely if there's a problem with a shipment. Um, but if you look in that far left uh, picture, that's actually the beginning in 2012 at the Phoenix uh, AZA annual conference of uh, the AZA animal transport course. Um, I'm currently uh, gonna be stepping down soon as the AZA animal transport course course administrator. And that was the first workshop uh, that that course developed from. And they were doing a crate demonstration and um, there'll be some other pictures that you'll see later on. But zoos have a very long process, as some of the zoo people have uh, explained, for shipping an animal. And the animal shipment itself is the very end of that process. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're shipping them in the right container. You wanna make sure that you've prepared that container properly. Um, I've even gone to, uh, it, when we shipped a sloth, showed a ruler because the, the stick at the top where the sloth has to hang has to be a certain number of inches away from the top of the crate so that I could show fish and wildlife that it has been installed properly uh, and took a picture of it because I wanted them to see that the crate was prepared properly. And um, things like that are really important. I, I make sure that the crate is approved by the airline as well as the inspectors before we take the animal to the airport. Um, you want to make sure that you've coordinated everything that the animal is not going to be stressed out. So you want to make sure that the logistics are all set up and that everybody knows what their job is and what they're supposed to do. So there should be a lot of meetings and talking beforehand. And you want to make sure that everybody is set to go. And it's always a good idea to have debriefings after your shipments so that you can prepare for the next one, make sure that you've got your problem solved before you go on another shipment. So there's an alphabet soup out there that I know you've been hearing about. And whether it's interstate, intrastate or international, there's medical concerns, possession and is the animal protected? It depends on what state you're in. Uh, we were talking about, you know, somebody's going with their pet iguana. Well, if you come to Florida, you can't bring your pet iguana because they're illegal. You gotta have a permit to have an iguana. Uh, it'll get confiscated from you. And, and if you don't take it out of the state fast enough, they might euthanize it on you. So, um, and, and a lot of these regulations, as everyone has said, 
change annually. The forms change annually. Um, I was involved with uh, when the injurious wildlife uh, regulations were changing. We were importing uh, some dole from San Diego. And two months before the dole entered the state of Florida, Florida Fish and Wildlife decided they were gonna change their regulations as well. And they created a whole new permit, uh, a whole new inspection process. And even the regulators didn't know what they were supposed to do. And I found my inspector at the same workshop that I was at to try and figure out what we were supposed to do before the dole could enter the state. So things change at a rapid pace nowadays. It's not as slow uh, uh, and as some have said, the regulations haven't changed for 70 years. Well, they're changing at a much more rapid pace. And it is good if you have somebody to do your paperwork for you that knows what they're doing. Um, so Migratory Bird, Injurious Wildlife, Endangered Species Act. Uh, some animals are being deregulated. Some animals are being uplisted. Um, USDA, they're changing their regulations. Sounds like there's gonna be a lot more changes with animal transport. So everybody needs to keep their ears to the ground and make sure that they're up to speed with that stuff. The IATA, very important. Um, I know the registrar community shares their books, um, but they also check to make sure they have the most current version of the crate that they're supposed to use. Uh, they don't change every year, so sometimes uh, if they have an older version and it's a zoo that has a bigger budget, they'll share their old version with another zoo that doesn't have a large budget, and, but they'll check and make sure if they have uh, an older version, is that crate still the same this year as it was two years ago? So with this alphabet soup, there are some organizations that are training their members all about transport, about regulations, keeping them up to date, AZA is one of them that is really on top of this stuff. And they're in Washington, DC. They have advocacy days um, and go to uh, DC annually. Uh, they have a zoo caucus. Uh, the ZRA has a training program for the zoo registrars. They have a certification program that you can train and they have in modules, different types of modules for different types of paperwork. Uh, transaction paperwork, they talk about ethics and records, they talk about permits, um, and ZAA has also started to develop some of their training uh, processes for their members as well. So I always say if you want to know uh, more and you need help, contact the zoo registrar. They're usually, if they don't know, they'll know who to contact to help you out. So uh, we talked about, you know, steps of planning and zoological transports. There's different reasons for transports. People have also brought that up. Um, you need to do a lot of things to prepare in advance. You want to exchange information because sometimes the vet will see something in that animal's medical history that will say, we don't even want that animal. Um, there was an opportunity in Miami uh, where I used to work as the registrar for a wild caught uh, Burmese python from uh, the uh, education collection for Florida Fish and Wildlife that they were using to educate people. And it, this was actually uh, an animal that had been born in the Everglades. And they thought, ooh, wouldn't this make a cool story for an ambassador animal? So the vets said, okay, well, first we got to test it, make sure it doesn't have any viruses or diseases before we bring it into the collection. Unfortunately, it had some bad viruses that they didn't want to bring it in, and it ended up having to be euthanized. So even, even though they were trying to do a good thing, there was no way they could even bring that animal into the collection. So checking the animal out before it comes in sometimes means you don't have the transaction. Um, sometimes it's for a collection planning purpose, um, so, and sometimes that collection planning might not entail breeding. It might just be exhibition. You might have a bachelor group of gorillas. Um, so, or it might be a female that's being put into a group to help raise other babies in the group in a breeding uh, group. Um, Pre-ship testing, very important. That also changes. Veterinarians are moving more towards less time in quarantine and more pre-ship testing. So they're putting their work up front and not as much time in quarantine for the animal. Permits take a long time. You want your person that's doing the permits to start on those right away. 
In order to do that, they need to find out what animal are we talking about, what regulations apply. If it's gonna take a long time, they need to get on those right away. Sometimes it can take up to a year to get your permits. And for international permits, they usually only last six months. In Florida, um, well, this rabies alert thing, uh, between the rabies alert and the heat restrictions in Florida, it took us a year to try and export a giant otter to Colombia. And by the time we were able to export her, uh, the airline that we were using, unfortunately, did not load the crate. We had to keep the animal in the crate overnight, reschedule the flight for the next day. The animal made it to Columbia and was fine, but the, like a day after she got there, the permit expired. So we just made it under the, you know, under the line and, and it was very, like I was pulling my hair out and uh, we were lucky that she got there in time. But all of these things are steps that are taken and things that are thought of. And you also, the reason that it was so um, important with otters, otters have to be shipped at 70 degrees. Um, their core body temperature goes up when they get stressed out. 70 degrees in Miami and Columbia is really hard to find that degree uh, to ship an animal. <laughs> And uh, even in the cool months, it's very difficult to get to 70 degrees in Florida and Columbia. So we were really lucky we were able to get her out. Out of three shipments that we were supposed to do, that was the only one we were able to accomplish because another one that we were supposed to do to Trinidad and Tobago, we were not able to do because we were in a quarantine uh, for rabies for uh, almost a year because of the wildlife around our zoo, not because of our animals. Uh, the raccoons around our zoo were coming positive with rabies. And so because of that, we were every six months having to say, okay, okay, we no rabies in this last dead uh, raccoon. Oh, we just found another one. Oh, it was positive. Okay, we got to wait six more months. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to have to renew that permit again. So it's, it's very complicated to try and plan these things. So you have to continually discuss, okay, where are we at now? What's the next step? And plan it all over again. Um, people don't think about bugs, but uh, this is a case study of a beetle import. This particular um, source for these beetles was in Colombia. I was in communication with him a lot. He was used to shipping uh, these beetles to Japan, which I guess they don't have as many restrictions as the United States does. And he said, oh, it's no big deal. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I got, I, let me get my permit. You know, I still have to finish getting my permit in order. Uh, okay, I got my permit. And uh, he never told me that his permit and his customs broker was in Texas. My permit was for Miami. So I get a call from Houston. Are you Rochelle Rogers? Are you importing some Hercules beetles from Columbia? Yes. You're, you're from Houston? Okay, but they're coming into Miami. Well, uh, we have these beetles coming in here. And I'm like, you do? Did something happen to the plane? Or no, they're, they're here coming in here. They're not supposed to come in there. I immediately had to send out emails to everybody and say, there's a problem. Uh, we have these animals coming into the wrong port. I wasn't aware they were coming in there. So they were nice enough to partially clear them through Houston to Miami. At that point, I didn't realize I was under investigation. So we get to Port of Miami to go pick up the beetles. And here comes three USDA inspectors to check in my beetles. They won't let me go see the beetles. They start asking me questions and they got clipboards. And I'm like, um, you know, well, so what's the problem with the beetles? Well, like, you know, your permit says Miami, but they came in the Houston. Yeah, I, the guy told me that, you know, uh, and so I'm trying to explain everything that happened. They realized that there was a problem with communication with the guy in Columbia. And so they believed me, 
But when we went to the airport, nobody had cash on them. And apparently they were in this holding area that you had to have cash to get them out. So the USDA inspectors were nice enough to give me cash to pay for the beetles to get out of the holding area so that we could get our beetles and go on our way. So I always say, knowing people and having a good relationship with your wildlife agency partners is always a good thing. And the Continental Airlines staff was very helpful because they also were very cooperative in helping me to get the beetles out. And here are the players on this import. And if you look down at this guy right here, you see that color, that's a bad sign that he's not healthy. This is what color they're supposed to be when they feel good and they are in good shape. This is not good when they're this color. So um, these are the containers they were shipped in. And because they came through the wrong airport, they were actually in those containers for an extended period of time that they shouldn't have been in those containers. So that's why they weren't in good shape when they came in. Um, a day or so after we lost one and maybe within, um, I would say like a couple of few months after, uh, all of them had died. So we open up a new exhibit, we paid $800 a piece for these uh, animals and we didn't have them for the new exhibit. Um, so I asked the director if we could not do that again because it didn't work out for us. Um, hummingbirds, we were talking about hummingbirds and I, I asked a question about feeding. Um, so there was a place in, in Canada that was closing down. It was a pavilion. It was beautiful garden. It was in Quebec and uh, they had butterflies, but they also had hummingbirds in with the butterflies. And because they were closing down, they were trying to get rid of the uh, hummingbirds quickly. This area where the beetles were, it's called Amazon and beyond. And so these hummingbirds were scheduled to go into this area as well. Several zoos were involved with this import. So uh, I spoke to Fish and Wildlife and they said, if you get all the zoos to send you your permit applications, then you can submit all of them in one packet and then we'll review all of them and they'll all be returned and given to everybody at the same time. It will help expedite the process because we had a, a concerns about their welfare because once they were removed from the pavilion, they were in small cages. And so we didn't want them to be in those small cages for an extended period of time because that wasn't good for them. So the guy kept calling me and emailing me, you know, hey, when are you going to get these birds? When are you going to get the permit? Because they're not doing good. And so then I, I kept contacting Fish and Wildlife and uh, Melanie, uh, who was the person that I was uh, in touch with, I explained to her what was going on. And she said, is it a welfare issue? I said, yes, they're afraid they're going to die if they stay in these cages too long. So they expedited our permit application so that we could get the hummingbirds in. And so we were able to get them in uh, quicker than normal. But these are the uh, IATA uh, container requirements. And in the container, you have to have a light and you have to have more than the normal amount of nectar so that they can feed all the way during their transport so that they don't starve to death before they get to where they're going. Their metabolism is so fast that they can actually starve to death before they get to where they're going if you don't feed them all the way. So they're, they're really small animals, complicated, uh, and we were trying to get them safely to the United States from the small to the big. Um, this is an elephant that was imported from Australia to Miami. He was, uh, it took a year to plan. He was actually in crate training for a year. Um, there was a metal cr elephant crate sent to uh, the zoo in Australia and he was trained to go in the crate. He was very comfortable in the crate. They would feed him in the crate. He was used to being in there for extended periods of time. The trainers, uh, the keepers, which trained him, were very good trainers. And uh, he was very comfortable in there. 
the aircraft that was uh, hired to cargo to bring him to Miami, he was the only cargo. So it was him and the crew that came. There were two veterinarians and two uh, animal managers, uh, one from San Diego, one from Miami that came with On Guard from Australia. So this shows them picking up the crate and then uh, before transport and then loading him into the belly of the plane. And before he left, you know, we, we everybody was alerted. We actually had police that wanted to be involved in helping us so much that they volunteered their time to escort us from the airport to the zoo. And by the time they came, it was nighttime. And so they, we had police in front of us and in back of us to escort us to the zoo to come in uh, after the plane landed. But then <laughs> talk about contingency plans. Who knew that there was gonna be a volcano eruption in Hawaii? And as a result of that, I, I, I'm always, when I have an international shipment, I always go to that Flight Aware app and like, okay, we're, okay, it's over Germany now. Okay, I can go back to sleep. Okay, where is it now? Okay, South America, okay. Well, I went to the emergency management website for Hawaii and oh, there, there's possibly a tsunami is gonna go to Honolulu, oh. That's where the plane is supposed to land and refuel. And the Honolulu Zoo is supposed to be our backup plan. This is not good. So I immediately alerted all the wildlife agencies. We might have a problem and we might not be able to land in Honolulu because there's possibly a tsunami coming. Well, and, and I get an answer back. Rochelle, you can't do that because it's not in your permit. I send an email back with links to the emergency website with maps showing the zoo would be that the, the uh, airline's runway would be underwater if a tsunami came and that the plane wouldn't be able to land and, the, and saying, yes, I know, this is the emergency website. This is the landing field. This is where the zoo is. And we need approval to land someplace else if this happens. And they said, oh, we understand what you're talking about now. So even though you think everything's just going along fine, you never know what you need in your contingency plan. Um, now, talking about neonatal uh, non-human primates, I've worked in research with non-human primates, zoos, and um, also uh, private sector. I worked at Monkey Jungle in Miami for a while. Um, there's different needs for these primates that are in different situations. When you get confiscated neonates, they're traumatized when you get them. Um, this uh, baby baboon uh, that's on the far uh, left here, she was uh, confiscated at the Port of Miami. Unfortunately, when she came in, I had already gone home for the day, but I had been told when you come in tomorrow, there's a new baby and I would always be the one that would take care of the babies because I had the most primate experience. Uh, there's a new baby that you're gonna have to take care of on top of doing your area. Um, she's confiscated and she's in the quarantine building. Uh, so be sure and check her when you come in tomorrow, Rochelle. And, and I said, okay. So the supervisor thought he was doing the right thing. And he, he gave her water and monkey chow. She was this big. She was too little for monkey chow. So when I came in the next day, she was all bloated and she's sitting in this cage going, oh, oh, cause she was bloated, she hurt, you know? So I was like, oh my God, what did they do to her? So we got her, you know, we helped her out. She had lice all over her. She had all kinds, she had to take uh, medicine that made her throw up. The poor thing was in horrible shape, but here she's like twice as big as she was then. And this was back in the nineties before they had implemented any PPE. So that's why I'm like so close to her. But she, she was um, probably, maybe about eight months. She was a little bit smaller than what she should have been, but she was much healthier. She had hair there. <laughs> she didn't have very much hair when she came in and she was a really good uh, baby at that point. I would take her out in the field uh, and try to teach her to uh, look for bugs and uh, climb up in trees. And people would see me out in the field like, 
what's what's going on with Rochelle? Uh, I tried to teach her natural behavior. She ended up going to the Moore Park College in California, and she lived to be 30 years old. I'm not sure if she's still alive or not, but I had been told by some people that she was always a really good animal, and they really liked her a lot. So she lived a really long life. I'm assuming she's still alive, but I'm not sure. Um, but her name was Olive. She was an olive baboon, and um, she was great. Um, this... Oops, sorry. This baboon here, um, I worked for a private sector uh, park that um, I had to take this animal. This is when she was younger, when she was being hand raised. Um, I had to take her to a TV show for Good Morning, Morning America. And uh, so I had to acclimate her to a soft sided uh, crate to be able to put her under the seat. I, I personally did not feel that that was appropriate, but I was, I was the zookeeper and I, and I was being told to do this. So I focused on the animal and how can I do this the most humane way where she's not going to be stressed out. So I made it a part of my routine to put her in this soft-sided bag. It was like a duffel bag and I just walk around the park with her in the bag. Nobody knew she was in there. And she kind of got so used to it, she liked it. She wanted to, she got excited about going in the bag and being able to see people through the bag, but they couldn't see her. And she got very acclimated to the bag. I'd put her stuffed toy in there. And you can see there at the top where she really liked that stuffed toy. And she'd have toys, you know, things to play on in there. But I would, I did that. She got so acclimated to that, that it was no big deal for her to be in that soft-sided crate for a long time. She didn't mind it at all. And this is another trip here with some other primates for the same facility. This is a capuchin and this is an orangutan. Uh, we went by FedEx. I loved going by FedEx because um, the animals were in crates on the other side of the netting. I was in a jump seat and as soon as we were in the air, I could go and check on them. Um, they even, I don't know if we were supposed to do this, but they let me take them out of the crate and, and play with them and, and uh, you know, make them feel comfortable and feed them and stuff and then put them back in. And then uh, we'd close the crate back up and they could see me. I wasn't that far away, so they didn't get stressed out. And that was uh, a really nice way to travel with primates. Um, since the TV station was paying for the flight, the owner of the animals didn't care how much it cost, but I, I thought that was really great. But this is something you have to do if you're doing overnight travel with animals and you're exhibiting them. You have to fill out the overnight itinerary form. So uh, if you're an exhibitor. Um, this is a chimpanzee that was being reared by its mother. This is Dr. Scott Satino. And the baby had contracted a, uh, a neonatal virus um, that's, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the virus, but it's, it's a common virus that human children get. And so we had to pull the baby from his mother and treat him. And so I had to take him home because there was no nursery facility at the zoo at that time. And so, it's something that you, you, in Florida, you're not allowed to take class one species off site unless you have a permit. Well, because Zoo Miami was a government uh, run zoo, they're managed by Miami-Dade County, we were exempt from the permit. So I was allowed to take the baby home, but I would never tell anybody that I had the baby at home because I didn't want anybody coming over to expose the baby to anything. And I would, you know, I would sometimes take lemurs home, uh, baby primates, you know, because I was the main baby primate person at the zoo. And this animal ended up um, being, going back to, we had a loan agreement with this person uh, that actually owned these animals and um, was not reintroduced back to the mother because it was being hand raised in it needed an extended period of time to be separated from the family. But this is, you know, not every state has this requirement. So if we weren't a government zoo, I would have had to have been permitted 
to take the baby off site. So you'll, if you do this type of activity, you wanna have people that are on permits and make sure that they're covered so that you can do that type of work. IATA live animal regulations. There's a type of crate for every type of animal. Um, and as everybody has said, uh, some of the crates are not IATA you know, compliant. Um, if you look at this over here, if they had put a wire cage inside the crate, this wouldn't have happened. Um, these are uh, the crates, like I was telling you, where we had a crate demo and people were learning about you know, what kind of crates you use for what type of animals. There's all different sizes. Um, this is a crate that was used for eggs. Um, eggs have to be shipped at a static temperature and humidity. And so you have to make sure they're in the appropriate container. It's almost like a, like a cooler. Um, and then, you know, there's, when you take large animals, they have to be in forklifts and there's, it's a big production. Um, this is um, Frank uh, Cohn, Gretchen Bickert and Matt James. And this was also part of a cor the course, the animal transport course where they were checking out a crate, showing people how it works. And this, this crate is one of those metal uh, crates. I don't know if, um, you know, there's any way that like, you know, I know Dr. Bryant was talking about, we need to talk to the crate companies. It'd be great if the companies that make these type of crates could come up with some way that when they, when they vibrate, that the metal doesn't shake and rattle and make noise the whole time that the animal's in it, because that's gotta drive the animal crazy when they're being shipped. Um, but that's one of my pet peeves about those type of crates. This uh, shows about different types of features of crates. And this is a really good document that shows about where you should put uh, different labels. And it talks about time and temperature. Uh, time and temperature is very important when you're shipping live animals or even commodities that can spoil like food or live fish or think even like shrimp that you eat, uh, you wanna make sure that the time and temperature is taken into account when they're being shipped. Okay, so choosing a transporter. Um, in the zoo industry, there are very specific transporters that we use for elephants, for hoof stock, for birds. Uh, birds generally get shipped by air. Uh, but now, as everybody has been saying, because we're limited on flights that we can do direct, we don't want to do flights where there's a layover because um, you, we've had shipments where the bird gets loaded on the wrong flight and it ends up someplace where it's not supposed to go. Um, uh, it gets lost. Um, the, the wrong bird goes to the wrong zoo. Um, so we want a flight that goes from point A to point B. Those types of flights are very rare now. And there's very few airlines that are shipping. And United um, used to ship directly from the United States mainland to Guam. And that was our flight that the zoos used to use for the, uh, King, the Guam Kingfishers and the Guam Rails for the release program. That program has basically been shut down. They're still trying to work out some way to get the animals there, but um, because we don't have a flight that we can use to send the animals there. So airlines are very important to us for that very reason. So um, those animals, we need to come up with a way to get that taken care of so that we can continue to do that. Um, but ground transport, very rarely do, do people use uh, vessels, water uh, shipments, but I'm sure there may be times when they need to do that. So it's very important to know what size plane and if it's got a connecting flight, you need to make sure that that's the other thing. The connecting flight might not be the same plane that you think it is. Um, there was a when United, what was it, Continental and United, I think when they merged, the planes that they bought, some of them had climate controlled cargo and some of them didn't. So they said, we can't guarantee that the plane that you think is coming 
is going to be there and be able to take live cargo in the cargo bay. So we can't take an animal on this flight because the connecting flight, we don't know if it's going to have the right type of cargo bay. So it, it's really tricky now to do uh, flights. Um, this, you know, this is appropriate if you're doing a short transport, but if, you know, it may not be applicable, you know, maybe zoo to zoo, um, if an animal's inside a, a crate, uh, you know, or there's an emergency or something, um, because you, you might need double containment depending on the species, depending on what state you're going through and the regulations. I love this company. Um, I worked with them on a hyena import. They have the most amazing crates um, and they're very good to work with. They did all the logistics in Europe for uh, that uh, import and we were getting hyenas from different uh, zoos. They did all the logistics in Europe and then they got the animals to the airport and they all came in and the crates were amazing. I loved it. This is, you know, like you say, when you're in the wild, you have to do what you got to do. It's almost like an emergency thing, but they were doing some uh, uh, rescue or, or transport of giraffes. People see this and they think, oh God, that's horrible. But it's actually one of the safest uh, ways they, to translocate rhinos in Africa. And it's very effective. They've moved a lot of rhinos this way and it's been very safe and effective. Um, so you always want to make sure that you have your ducks in a row as far as knowing who's transporting your animals. Uh, some people use contracts with their transporters and are very regimented. Some people don't. So it's up to uh, your institution how they operate. There's also a lot of now nonprofit uh, transporters. Um, this particular uh, company, uh, well, it's not a, it's a non, it's a conservation. They, try, they tried to teach me how to say it. They're not an airline. They're a conservation flying a organization. The, the pilots fly for free using their own uh, planes. You don't pay them anything, but it's very difficult to work with them because you, you have to spend a lot of time doing logistics and everything, but they're doing a lot of work for conservation reasons. So they'll only work in the United States. They'll only work with endangered species. So there's a lot of caveats. You can't use them for everything. There's also one that works with turtles. And I saw a thing on TV about that organization. I saw people taking banana cardboard boxes of banana, banana boxes with sea turtles putting them in the planes. So it's very um, unconventional. Um, and the people that work with the animals are the ones that go with the animals on the planes. Um, but it's a different way of transport that kind of probably falls outside the regulations and to, to a certain extent. Um, but a lot of people are starting to use these uh, pr service providers. And that's me. And that's the end of my talk. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. If you have any questions and you are virtually, please put it in the Q&A and Karen will answer it for you. Is anybody awake? <laughs> Everybody's awake, what okay. are you talking about? <laughs> any questions in here? Karen, any questions? Let me check. It says, Rachel, zoos and university research have known since 1980s that the best way to ship hummingbirds is essentially in socks or some other restraint in hand, in a passenger seat next to a professional keeper so the birds can feed on a regular basis during the flight. This gives the greatest stability. How do you think professionals can effectively work with IATA and the federal agencies in the US to establish best practice great regulations for the animal's best welfare, no matter what the species and the animal age might be. Okay, I have an answer for that. Um, there are groups that have worked with Frank Cohn. Um, he has worked with TAGS uh, 
that uh, like he's worked with uh, people with uh, the penguin crates, um, but you, you, you can't work as an individual. It has to be a group um, and he's willing to help you write up your proposal to IATA and present it to them in the IATA meetings. Um, but it has to be done a certain way. He knows how to write those requests up. So if anybody wants to do that, I can give you his contact information and he works with groups to do that very type of work. Okay, any additional questions in here? I have a comment on here. It says, Rachel, Olive was donated to Metro Zoo by US Fish and Wildlife Services on 7 October, 1987, and then donated to Moore Park on 1 November, 1987. She died 8 January, 2021 at the age of 34. Wow. 30 go Olive. <laughs> That's awesome information. She was a good baboon. <laughs> Any additional questions, Karen? Okay. Well, a round of applause, please. Thank you. For Rachel Rogers. <laughs>